Welcome to Inflection Points. This is a podcast about big ideas from the office of the CTO at Extreme Networks. I'm Tim Harrison. And I'm Carla Gazzetti. And we're going to be talking about the technology of the infinite enterprise today. What do you think, Carla? Big topic? I think it's a great topic. I think it's also about time that as a tech company, we talk about the technology. <laughs> because right. we've uh, talked a lot about what's the idea? How does this change the questions? How does this change, you know, the business conversation? And people are probably going, um, aren't you in charge of technology? Right. Yeah. Maybe we should talk about some of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about some of that stuff. Um, I think as we go into it, um, you know, one of the things we talk a lot about here at Extreme and particularly within the office of the CTO is this idea of crawl, walk, run, you know, uh, starting in technology, we, we start with, okay, it, it's kind of working. Okay. It's really working. Oh, it's really working now. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's suddenly moving at uh, at pace. Yeah, the, there's there's so much uh, from a technological standpoint within the concept of the infinite enterprise, and we are in the crawl phase at the moment. We're working through what do these technologies look like going forward? What will they do for us today and tomorrow? And then what do they look like in the future? So what we've done is we've spoken to the people who are actually implementing these technologies. We've, we started with the big philosophical ideas with, uh, with Nabil Bukhari, our CTO and chief product officer. And now we're gonna talk to the people who are charged with actually making those big ideas work from a technological standpoint. Yeah, taking something that seems abstract and and, and making it real and uh, making it possible for our customers. So, yeah, as you said, we've pulled three people who are right now uh, working in the crawl phase of the infinite enterprise. Uh, and we're going to first uh, speak with Anu Gade, who is our senior director of product management for Wired. Um, and then she works really closely with Juven Patel, who's our senior director of product management for cloud and wireless technologies. And then I think we have one more person who's joining us and who's that? We have Bill Lundgren, who is the director of product management, cloud architecture and operations. Yeah. So as uh, you said, these three people that I think we have got the guys and the lady and the woman who are at the heart of trying to figure out exactly how we do this, because that is one thing that we have not answered yet. How do you do the, how do you build the infinite enterprise? So I'm really excited uh, to see what they have to say, because even though networking technology is not my, my particular background, I know I've been sitting back and going, oh, how H-E double hockey six, do you make that happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do come from the technology background and and it's it's something that is key in my mind is how do you how do you take the idea and turn that into an actual technology that can be delivered or a series of technologies that can actually be, be delivered. With the infinite enterprise being this decentralization, this expansion out into the periphery uh, so that the user has the same experience they would have in the center. The people who are working to deliver these technologies have to keep that in mind and have to figure out how to take that experience and decentralize the experience. So I think it's going to be really interesting to understand their perspective and their point of view coming from the actual execution of technology um, and trying to take that input of this big idea of the infinite enterprise and output something that, that takes us from crawl to walk to run. I totally and completely agree. And I, I'm fascinated to see what they have to say. So should we go and have a chat with them? I think we should. And I think it's going to be fantastic. Let's go. All right. To begin, I just want to first say thank you all for taking the time out uh, to actually join us to talk about this. It's uh, the Infinite Enterprises a very big vision statement uh, from our chief technology officer and our chief product officer, Nabil Bukhari. Uh, and all of us are, are working toward that vision and uh, have been talking with him about defining it. So with uh, the infinite enterprise, as we know, uh, the concept is that we feel that the network is going to continue to be distributed, uh, so much so down to the individual, so that you have a personalized experience. And 
in our podcast today, we thought we would bring in the experts from within Extreme Networks to talk about, you know, how do we achieve this? How do we technically achieve this? In previous podcasts, we've identified what it is. We've talked about the changes in motivation. How do you make business decisions about this? But you kind of have to step back and go, hey, we're Extreme Networks. When are we going to be talking about the technical side of it? So we thought, why don't we get the technical geniuses behind it and, and bring them on in uh, and talk about it? So thank you for taking the time and, and for uh, participating in this with us. Um, so we have an understanding of the infinite enterprise. It's a world in which network comes to the individual, as I said, and as opposed to the other way around. How far away technically are we from something of that scope uh, from coming to pass? And walk me through the process and how to get there. Maybe Jeevan, you could start us off with uh, your thoughts on this. Yeah, absolutely. Kyla, thank you so much for inviting me to this podcast. This is an incredible opportunity. Firstly, as I see the infinite enterprise is where, you know, we are starting to see, you know, instead of us going into work and working out of that, instead of, you know, people working out of branches, uh, we have people working everywhere in their homes. And this is where this is such an incredible transition that's happening. The pandemic has really started converting everybody to the digital enterprise. And this is where we are starting to go. So quite frankly, the first step, the driver for this is already there. Now, when we think about the technology, there are a few pieces that are already in place. We start thinking about you know, various components from cloud to connectivity to performance. So... You know, I think from a crawl, walk, run standpoint, we're already in the crawl phase. Uh, G1, what technologies have brought us here? Um, there have been lots of technologies out there for remote connectivity um, and for remote sites. What's been there before and, and what actually counts and is valid going forward? So I think that's a really good question, Tim. Um, when you think about... You know, how did people work before this is I think there was a simple world of people used to connect out of home routers. They used to VPN into work, you know, and, and that was pretty much the way that most of the people worked on it when they were part time from home. But now the world has really evolved. Think about any of the documents that we collaborate in, whether it is uh, Google Docs, whether it is uh, Microsoft-based documents, you know, on OneDrive, we are all sharing documents. We are all working out of this. And guess what? These documents do not require you to actually VPN into work. You don't require to actually do VPN in order to even check your emails and such. But here is the biggest problem for IT. Guess what we are doing right now? This podcast is happening in an infinite enterprise world with all of us thousands of miles away from each other doing recording together. And this is all happening from homes. And the way that our IT needs to support us, they need to have a very uh, high performance network, just like I would be at Extreme Headquarters. They need to have the same ability to understand how my applications are behaving, how my experience over Zoom is. And they would need to troubleshoot and diagnose things whenever things were to go wrong. You know, if I have to have a customer meeting, that's the kind of things that my IT team need to think about and sort of help us solve it. Okay, so if I'm going to summarize that, that's pretty, that's a massive shift because what you're saying is rather than us being able to experience that hands-on IT experience when we're in the office, now it's like our IT support is going to be sitting next to us. So we've got to take that in-office experience and, and be able to narrow it down to the individual office. And I know personally that it, that would be huge for even for someone like me to be able to manage their own IT. But it also seems like it's going to be have several difficult technical achievements in creating an enterprise that can support that. And Bill, I'm wondering if you could give us some color on like what are the major milestones in order to get there for those technical achievements for the infinite enterprise? Well, I think there's a, a couple of things that we have to work, <clears throat> look at, and namely is that is the elimination of layers is that, you know, to, to Jeevan's point, if you have uh, all this remote workforce and a disparately also remote IT support organization, 
it's very difficult to troubleshoot these things. So you cannot have layer upon layer. I can't have your laptop and your operating system and then a VPN client that may or may not work and all of this complexity. I need to have a streamlined, easy way for you to get access to that cloud infrastructure, which is where, you know, today's current cloud, things like, to Jeevan's point, the um, the online document sharing, things like OneDrive and, and et cetera, Google Drive, simplify that greatly. Because now, to your point, there's no VPN client. There's nothing complex for me to troubleshoot. We're not talking about troubleshooting effectively browser issues, things like that. But then as we start to, to extend, you know, more and more networking at home, we need to have a way to take all of the stuff that is now disparate. So all of these things that have moved to cloud and, and all of these things that are now no longer in our corporate data centers, we need to have a way to secure it. We need to have a way to understand where that data is going. And we need to under, have a way of understanding where this disparate network, uh, how it's evolving and how that network is, is being utilized and areas where there potentially is contention. And that's where they also too, from like a you know cloud IQ's perspective, uh, how we can tie that all together as as one contiguous environment and give you one screen and pane of glass to look at it. So that sounds very much like a, and and I, in some ways I hesitate to say this. And you know certainly single pane of glass has always been a challenge for some for some organizations to to get around. But one of the things that seems to be coming out of this is an end to end concept. Um, Anu, I'm wondering if you could uh, take me down that path. What does end to end mean? Or what would that kind of solution look like? How, how do we get to end to end from where we are today? So I think we have already embarked on this cloud journey, right? Um, with the advent of uh, software as a service type of applications uh, over the last couple of years and the infrastructure as a service um, type of uh, infrastructure services, I think we are already well on our journey. Uh, what, what is important for, a, for an IT administrator to have visibility is really from the user standpoint all the way to the applications that are being accessed by the user. Uh, because applications can go anywhere, can be in their private data center, can be in uh, public cloud, um, and the user is remote and accessing all those applications. So, so imagine IT is troubleshooting a problem for a given user who is probably accessing a SaaS application. And if the experience is not optimal, um, they need to really have visibility from all the way to the, you know, from the user level to the application level. So being able to look at, you know, what's going on at the access layer is my, are my switches along the path uh, doing the right thing? Are they, are they performing, you know, as, as expected, or are there any bottlenecks? Uh, is there any congestion issues along the path? Uh, is my application running uh, at an optimal level, right? Are there any bottlenecks uh, in terms of accessing the application? So, so those are all the important aspects um, to be able to troubleshoot and uh, narrow down the problem uh, and kind of fast track uh, problem resolution for, for uh, users who are working in this infinite enterprise uh, mode of operation for, for probably f- for a long time to come. <laughs> this probably is going to become a new norm. Even when we all go back, I think uh, some of us will probably continue to work from, continue to work remotely. So I think this is going to be an ongoing item that needs to be addressed. I think that's great, and and one of that brings up to mind obviously the the concept of security. And I'm wondering if uh, Anu, maybe you can touch on that, and then maybe Bill, you could uh, talk about how that applies across the different platforms. Sure. So so in general, uh, I think with respect to security, there are a couple of things I want to talk about. First one is you know whether the user is in the corporate um, headquarters or a or a branch location or at a remote you know working out of home, we don't need to figure out a way to determine their access privileges. Because in this world of zero trust, you cannot just assume that the users are safe to access some applications. So it's it's all about role-based policies, as opposed to getting into the weeds of, you know, which VLANs do they need to go into, which access lists do they need to be kind of controlled by. Um, I, I think abstracting all that into a higher role type of a construct, which defines what those access policies are, um, I, I think that that would be a very important uh, item because being able to kind of just assign a role to users and no matter where they are, whether in whether they're in the headquarters or in a uh, in a home location, I think being able to enforce the same type of policies uh, makes a lot of sense. I think we are well on our journey. Um, Extreme has been supporting role-based policies for over a decade, and other vendors are also starting to add that um, in their um, solutions. I think the second aspect is once you access the applications, whether the customer data is is uh, protected, right? I think for, for our cloud uh, applications, 
we take security very seriously. Um, we do have ISO certifications to, to ensure that our customer data is protected, whether it is their uh, PIN type of information, personal identifiable information, or any other type of, you know, their their customer data, right? We, we do take that very seriously. And we are one of the only companies, you know, that has achieved this type of um, certification. And perhaps Bill can uh, add more to that. Um, I, he's an expert in this space. And actually, um, I have Bill, since you're an expert in the space, I, could you uh, define a ISO for me? You know, as a tech novice, in some cases, I was still learning about them. But uh, if you could just define it for us. Yeah, yeah, you bet. The ISO um, you know, or ISO, as it would be written, is actually the International Organization of Standards. It's completely opposite of what you think it mean. Uh, but it's because it's a Swiss organization, so the French translation. Um, but uh, effectively, what ISO does is they have a standard for everything. There are ISO standards for refrigeration. There are ISO standards for how you know signage should look for fire extinguishers. And they have an entire section of ISO standards that deal with data security uh, and data privacy and all sorts of aspects of secure communication type things. Um, the one that uh, we have, and we've actually had it for a number of years now, and we're actually on our, our second or third iteration of the audit, is a standard called ISO 27001. Um, that standard is, is a, a, a ubiquitous kind of data security standard, which sets forth uh, that you have an, uh, uh, a standard management policy and framework and a set of procedures for operating under, uh, I think there's 114 separate um, different elements within the standard that you have to have a policy for. So things like, and it's not just the, pro the product, it's things like HR policy. Do you actually do background checks on your employees? How often do you do them? Uh, when someone leaves the company or is terminated, how do you deal with that? Uh, from a purchasing perspective, how do you guarantee certain things that you're purchasing meet certain standards? Um, you know, clean desk policies, all of those things are part of ISO as well as the nitty gritty, you know, how do you guarantee that your code is secure? How do you guarantee that you're not, you know, somehow embedding uh, malicious code, much like the recent uh, um, uh, hacks that have, been, that have occurred with solar winds, um, disastrous type of, an, of a scenario where you actually are, you know, trustworthy company um, has got malicious code embedded in their code that now people are downloading thinking it's legit. Um, and ISO actually does have standards in within it to help prevent those kinds of measures. And so we've been uh, lucky enough to actually have ISO certification at the, for the 27,001 cert for a number of years now. Uh, we're recently, and actually next week, uh, I'll be uh, pretty much uh, my entire life will be occupied with uh, an audit for um, uh, two new ISO standards, the 27,017 and also the 27,701 cert. The uh, 2717 certification specifically tied to cloud type uh, applications. So this is a, a bolt on, if you will, to the 27,001, which takes it yet to another level with even more qualifications you have to meet, more standards and processes specifically tailored around operating in the cloud. And then we have the 27,701 cert, which is all encompassing dealing with data privacy. So if you are concerned about things like uh, the, the CCPA, if you are looking at G, uh, GDPR, or just in general wanting to protect data, um, the 27,701 sets forth a pretty much industry-wide universal global standard for protecting customer data and making sure that we're doing things like deletion and anonymization where it's, where it's appropriate and how we take and process and control various aspects of the data. I think that is so crucial. And thank you for really walking us through in detail what goes into that, because I know uh, increasingly everybody is concerned about where is their data stored? How are they using it? And what are the qualifications that people have to go through or companies have to go through in order to be qualified in order to collect that data? I think it is, it's so essential in it. And as we talk about, and frankly, you know, when I think about the infinite enterprise, it is definitely allowing your work retailers, healthcare, much more into your data than they currently have access. So it's important for people to really feel secure, particularly as we move to cloud. And, and Jeevan, I, it feels like you might have something that you want to add there. Sure. I mean, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we had some customers that were actually related to the banking industry. And this is where you had the CXO working from their homes and 
you know, one of the people attending their homes actually ended up uh, sort of, you know, accessing the internet and started doing some, you know, not safe for work things. Now, this is where it, it starts getting really tricky with the infinite enterprise. You are working from anywhere and this network has to be protected by by your company's IT. And back to how Bell described it, it's not a one-time thing. It's not just taking the data and saving it safely one time and you're done with it. This is a whole process that needs to be followed that sort of, you know, it's a repeatable thing. I mean, let me give you another example, right? I mean, think about a bank. You're not going to walk into any bank, you know, any private bank off the street and throw in your hard-earned money, your hard-earned savings and throw it there. You're basically going to look for FDIC insured bank and go there. So the same analogy that we have of banking, you know, sort of applies to this. So for people that don't know what is this 27,001, 27,017, 27,701 that Bill was talking about, right? Think about those types of analogies. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point, Jeevan, is there's a, you know, right now, data, if you think about it, the way we, we've based our business, it is it is the currency of the 21st century. You have to know where your data is and who has control of it. Uh, and that's why on top of all those ISO certifications, what we're doing here at Extreme is we just started the process because it's an extremely long duration process. But ISO makes you develop your standards and develop your processes. And then you're audited to show that those standards and processes are used. We're actually also undertaking a SOC audit and doing a SOC type two, which will bring in, you know, effectively you bring in a financial accounting firm that then looks for evidence that not only are you, do you have the policies, do you have the procedures, but are you living and breathing and actually doing what you say you're supposed to do? And then we'll be releasing that report uh, for our, co our customers as well by the end of 2021. Uh, we should have that down and nailed. So it, it's a, a, an all-encompassing kind of a view of not only do we have the policies and procedures, but we also can can back it up that, yes, we actually are obeying them. So it sounds like uh, the standards for security are continuing to evolve and there are going to be many more uh, objectives that every company out there is going to have to achieve in order to ensure that we are secure as the infinite edge uh, and the infinite enterprise uh, evolves. So if we are in a crawl scenario right now with the infinite enterprise, what is the walk and then the run? And Jeevan, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about what is the next phase in, in the evolution? Um, obviously, whatever it is, it has to be very secure, but where does technology have to go in order to get there, to get to the walk? That's a great question, Carla. So I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background. You know, all of us, you know, are in the technology industry and probably uh, really exceptions to to the rule. We are always used to working on the phone, on Zoom, you know, and so on. But basically, I've started talking to my friends back in India from the pharmacy industry. If I'm talking to some of my friends in sort of, you know, London that are actually in completely sort of, you know, different fields in shipping industry. And these guys have all started working from home. You know, they are monitoring their factories, you know, from you know, their homes, they are sort of, you know, monitoring uh, all their shipping equipment and everything, you know, from homes. So it it needs, you know, something that really makes it simple, needs to be scalable, right? I mean, it needs to be flexible. So let me kind of, you know, touch upon some of these things. You know, in the past, we had people with one headquarters and maybe a few tens of branches. And IT could get away with, uh, quite complicated, quite fixed networking architectures and really sort of, you know, design it once and keep it for the next five years, never touch it. But now there is a complete evolution of this. So it's like IT is told, forget about what you've done and you've deployed and everything. You got to change everything now. You might be asked to change it a few days from now. So it's like what's needed is flexibility. You might buy an access point, you might buy a switch, any gear, you might be able to sort of, you know, you might need to actually walk into work and sort of, you know, grab, grab a laptop, grab a, you know, access point and sort of, you know, plug it into Bill's homes, you know, plug it into uh, my home, you know, any of these, you know, need to be, you know, so that it can work anywhere. That's from the flexibility standpoint. So this is where Extreme started to embark on, you know, universal license. It's really simple. If you buy something, you should be allowed to deploy it 
anywhere in the world and absolutely no problem we have another concept of something called as a world skew this is incredible this is like why do you have to buy a separate access point hardware depending on where you live in the world why can't the intelligent cloud that bill was talking about really understand where you are in the world and accordingly uh, tell you what channels and power to operate with so we are starting to embark on all these things from a flexibility standpoint the next one is scale today we have over a million devices connected to extremes cloud iq but guess what the way that it's been architected it can go 10 times 100 times you know million times that it's really concept of horizontal scaling as they say in in cloud world you can actually add as many times you want to scale it's it's really super easy from that standpoint bill looked like you you wanted to touch on that as well oh no yeah <laughs> that's 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 100% true we the way we've built the cloud is it uh it, it's designed to just take whatever you want to throw at it um we, if if it's not big enough today we'll make it bigger in another 30 seconds and it will just keep going um we we've got uh, a pretty agile cloud that we've been able to construct that is multi cloud uh, so we we can support uh, operations and we do support operations on AWS on Azure on Google GCP uh, on premises is coming as well with the uh, dedicated instances so there's there's no lock in there's no fear of of anything ever really going down because it would require uh we we all have way more to worry about if if every one of our clouds is down than than the fact that it's down <laughs> so i think bill you touched on one of the most you know fascinating things sorry kala you know this thing is super exciting i can't stop you know talking about this the the downtime there is no nines right can you touch on that bill yeah pretty much the way we've I've got everything done is is yeah, I, i did a blog about this that we 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 hit a point of no nines uh in anywhere in our downtime number and uh jokingly because there isn't it's because we have 100% uptime uh there's there's no need to worry about how many nines and the way we do that is through a very uh precisely architected series of steps that we use to upgrade our software so we will do certain changes in a very particular order uh and while services may briefly blip as we restart things there's effectively no downtime um and we can flip back and forth between versions we can back things out if we need to move forward any direction we want um and without ever actually impacting the service and causing an outage excellent so i i think it's a, it's amazing that we have built this and so that it's flexible but the question is what's next for it what's the evolution right so we know that we we've got something that's going to be flexible and that's going to be scalable but where does it go from here so right now we have a cloud that can throw you could throw anything at it it sounds like but how does that equal to building out an infinite enterprise that is going to be able to handle far more IT far more connectivity than it's ever been able to handle before because obviously there are going to be amends that we need to make what's some of the technology that goes into that what's the thinking that goes into that and you know if you were going to look into your crystal ball and tell me what is cloud look like 5 years from now when uh, i can experience you know a movie theater and i can walk into nordstroms and have that full retail experience just sitting at my computer not online shopping right i'm not talking about online shopping but having the experience of shopping at home or having the experience of sitting next to jeevan while we're working in the office how do we make that come alive and how is technology have to change in order to get there so do you and maybe you can you can help us out with that yeah absolutely i think you you started the podcast with that comment right i mean it, it's almost like having it sit next to you in your house and help you every step of the way so what we are really focused on is the employee experience and what this really means is you know all the way from you know making it simple to buy sort of simple to deploy um and simple to monitor and manage and let's you know take every step you know for a second we are talking about it purchasing equipment for all the company's employees and sending it to not only you know the headquarters and the branches but also their homes and monitoring it so we have to make it really simple then we have to make it incredibly easy for people to use now all of us on this podcast are incredibly technical but we are talking about people that have never used a whole lot of technology it needs to be 
as simple as plugging in the ethernet cable and that's it that's pretty much it everybody does that with their home devices that's the level of simplicity that we're looking to to simplify it at and then beyond that when we talk about monitoring and manage this is where you know imagine if the voice in our podcast starts going flaky you know i want something to to pop up and tell me this is what to do you know move closer to the mic uh, mute something start sort of you know prioritizing this things need to happen for me automatically this is what we are sort of you know thinking about in terms of copilot the idea being you know you have somebody who's watching over your shoulder and helping you out with all the technical issues even if you are at home you know tim in this secluded cold barren desert <laughs> are in desert you know uh, even if you are in a very very far away place uh, you always have somebody next to you that's helping you out every step of the way this is what we are doing and for that it requires a significant amount of technology details from cloud in the back end to sort of how do you roll these different interesting applications out to end user devices and have that experience you know have that observability where in the network not only tells you what's wrong but tells you why it's happening you know what to do to get out of it is what we are doing so anu i'd like to follow up with you on that um and certainly from the crystal ball aspect of things um you know as we as we hear what uh, what jiwan's talking about and there's some really amazing ideas here and some great concepts and some great analogies and i'm in canada so it's not that far away of a desert uh but uh i'm i'm wondering if there are technologies or there are things that that you see in your crystal ball that are going to enable uh the infinite enterprise and it really will take us beyond where we are today what are those things that you see and and uh, and how do you see them adding that value as as a part of the infinite enterprise yeah that that's a great question tim um i think expanding on what jeevan has mentioned right i think actionable and meaningful insights with the with the remediation that is automated i think is probably the next phase of uh, where the next phase of innovation is going to happen it's it's one thing to say that you know maybe something is not is not working as expected but being able to root cause that problem and being able to self correct that i think that's where a lot of power is going to be uh, available for for administrators to be able to just take that recommendation Uh, or just set, set it up such that um, it basically takes that action automatically based on that condition i think that's probably where the next uh, set of innovations are going to come from um and it's not and it's also has to be end to end right it's not about access points or switches if you created a wireless ssid and uh, you want to ensure that that is available throughout the network uh, if somebody misses to configure you know something on the switch um that's connected to the access point uh, the traffic is going to be black holed right i i think these are very manual processes that are used today that can result in errors uh, that are difficult to catch so being able to detect those kind of scenarios and and being able to provide a quick actions to recover from those uh, failures i think that that's where uh, i would predict uh, uh, things to go uh th- so the other thing that i wanted to mention is also um with respect to branch offices detecting what applications are being used and being able to do something unique per application because you know now we all know we all live in the hybrid cloud world uh and some applications could be in the private data center and and some in public cloud or saas uh being able to determine what application uh needs to take what path uh in a most optimal fashion uh, i think that's that's also where a lot of innovations are going to come from Yeah that's great that you you beat me to it I was going to actually ask you about the the hybrid concept and and uh, how as we start to expand this uh it, it it makes sense that we need to be able to integrate hybrid uh deployments and be able to bring people into the cloud but work with their particular technologies that they have in in, in place today Bill I know you wanted to get in on that is is there something you wanted to bring in there I think we're to to Carlos point and everybody's point is is as this advances as you start seeing more work from home and and a more broader acceptance and almost a permanent work from home scenario is you know there's a lot of competition in this space kind of doing what we do there's a, you know we can we all can name the top competitors um and and AI and ML is like the number one buzzword of this industry um but if you look at what our competitors deliver um you know if 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 you've got this pool of data and all you're basically a telling me well my dhcp server's not working my dns or my dns server's broken or my radius server stopped responding 
you know, if, if an administrator finds that fascinating, it's my, it's the angry old man in me coming out. You've probably maybe picked the wrong career. <laughs> that's, that's IT 101, right? Oh my, I can't get an address. So that's maybe I should check the DHCP server. If I need a data lake and an AI engine to tell me that something's wrong, what we're looking at, and it's certainly you, you hit that low hanging fruit, but if you look at what cloud IQ does, we, and we have every one of our access points, every one of those switches that's managed is feeding data in filtered. We're processing at the edge close to four petabytes a day of data per day from hundreds of thousands of millions of clients and a million plus devices. That data is what's going into Cloud IQ. And we're building our AI and our ML and with, with, with Copilot to start looking at the real picture is what, what is that data really telling us? Is there, is, is there a systemic problem in the world with a new version of iOS? Are suddenly devices that upgraded from version X to Y now not connecting at the same you know, data rates? And are, is that why your users are experiencing these problems? Because you no longer have an office building to Jeevan's point. These, these local office buildings, 10, 12 branches. Well, now you've got 1,500 people working from 1,500 different branches. And so if I can take that data lake and start really mining it for the, the real good tidbits of how do I optimize my network? How do I make it do more with less and spend less? How do I solve these problems for a bulk of my users who are now using devices I may not necessarily control because they're mobile devices and iPads and every tablet under the sun? that's where we'll be able to really start seeing and where the industry needs to go is to support these remote users. It's the ability to dissect that data down to the finite level. And so what you're saying is the dissection of that data is really the building block to a lot of the auto magic that uh, we've been talking about here in the podcast. It, it's understanding those trends, making sure it's in a secure environment so that we can help be that friend looking over the shoulder going, you're going to want to do this, or you're going to want to change that setting. It's going to be so much more than just Amazon recommending something I've already purchased. <laughs> exactly. <right? laughs> Precisely. <laughs> so um, I, I think that's fantastic. And it's a, a great place for us uh, to wrap up everything because it is really just the jumping off point. Um, as we've talked about, we're in the crawl phase right now. There's so much more that's going to be coming out as the infinite edge uh, continues to expand and the infinite enterprise continues to expand and we evolve what that definition is and what it looks like. So it sounds like we've got a lot of very exciting things in the works and uh, we should really stop bothering you all so you can go back and build some technology for us <laughs> and get that ISO certification. I want to make sure that Amazon doesn't have too much of my data. Thanks. <laughs> I look forward to walking with all of you after we stop crawling. Wait until we run. Haven't done that since COVID started. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for your time and uh, for sharing your thoughts. And um, yeah, we look forward to talking again very, very soon. Thanks everyone. Thank, thank you. you. See you guys. Carla, as a technologist, I thought that was a really, really interesting conversation. There were some key points that that stuck out to me right away. One was that Data is a new currency, and I know that that conversation has been had overall throughout the industry for, for years, but as we get closer and closer to the edge and we get that infinite enterprise expansion out to the, the hyper-individualized experience, that data currency is really, really critical. Yeah, I, that stuck out to me as well. And I agree with you. There is a lot of chatter about data is the new currency, uh, but... In this world, in this scenario that we're talking about with this group, it is uh, much more than what it is right now, right? I, I think right now when we talk about uh, data as currency, it's, oh, well, they want to know my zip code and my preferences in order to tell me what sort of advertising should be targeted to me. But this is so much more than that. You can't provide hyper individualism without having much more information uh, from people. And I, I think, you know, the follow on from that that I also heard is how do you secure that? Yeah. And the, the securing of that means that any solution that is supporting the infinite enterprise needs to be end to end. So having the experience or understanding the experience from the very end customer, not necessarily just from the uh, network access point, as it were, or the entry onto the network is vital to be able to not only secure, but to understand uh, what that 
what that uh, hyper individual needs, that uh, that individual enterprise of one. Um, another thing that uh, Anu brought into that conversation was the identity and the policy. And, you know, to me, identity is a key to the new perimeter, like the actual periphery of the infinite enterprise requires policy and identity to be really well meshed together so that that individual, no matter where they are, has that same experience that they would have anywhere else in the infinite enterprise. Yeah. And I I think one thing that makes me wonder about is, you know, this means that, uh, you know, technology and, and companies that are enabling this technology and companies that decide to purchase this technology and use it, they have to all agree on how this new normal works in order for that to happen. Wouldn't you say that's fair? Yeah, there's, there's always been, you know, a a push for standardization within the industry, but this is more than standardization. This is really a, a standardized viewpoint. This is really moving the needle. It's changing the concept of building technologies for an enterprise to building technologies for the individual experience. Right. That that change of mind, I think, is really important for all of these technologies to to come to fruition and to actually serve the need. And the need is for that individual experience. It's that that infinite connectivity of all those different hyper individual enterprises. I know lots of big words. Right. But <laughs> as we're trying to take this philosophical concept and break it down into the thing that is the technology that delivers that experience, it's important to see those different layers and to try and access what they truly mean to the end user rather than just selling to an enterprise with speeds and feeds. You know, what is that end-to-end experience? So technology is an experiential thing rather than technology as just an enabler of getting more stuff through the network is is a a fundamental shift, I think. Yeah, I agree. And I also think um, what's key to that is, as we talked about, before we're in the crawl space of, of all of this evolution. And I have to say that it doesn't feel like we're going to get to run until we've had that shift, as you'd say, where everybody aligns and there's some sort of standardization because something that struck me while we were talking is that the technology is going to get to this point. We are, this isn't the, I never heard them say, well, we don't know how to get there or that it won't get there. It it's, it, it's going to arrive. Um, so it's really, that piece of how do we agree to all use it together? That's the part I think that is going to really be the run phase. Yeah, I agree with you. And when we look at what walk might be, right, today we may not have a clear view of walk. We we know what crawl looks like. And as crawl gets better and as we learn how to be better at crawling, uh, we'll find ourselves uh, naturally evolving into that walk and then into the run. I think what's going to happen is that the outside influences may shift a little, right? We're in, we're in full pandemic mode today, but in the future, it may not be full pandemic modes. That's the motivator. uh, That's the prime mover of, of these changes in, in technology. So there is an evolutionary path, I think, but it doesn't necessarily take us in an opposite direction. I think that the, the crawl and the walk are going to be short-term phases and the run is going to be the significant change going forward. Yeah, I, I, I agree. The run is when it's, uh, when it's been established and everybody's using it. But uh, I think, so if I was going to summarize, these are the things that I, that I heard from them. Number one, data is our new currency. We already know that, but that's only going to become more true and more important. Yeah, exactly. As data becomes important at the edge versus data being centralized deep inside of the enterprise. Absolutely. I'd say the second big takeaway for me is security, security, security. Right. <laughs> security is everything. <laughs> <laughs> at, at the risk of being repetitive, security, right? Being able to make sure that that data that's at the edge, making sure that the user experience is secured all the way end to end is, is critical. And I would say, I would tag on to that as well, that the, the identity of the user is critical in security. So um, Anu mentioned uh, zero trust. I think that these functionalities and these concepts uh, are going to be really, really critical in the securing of that user and of the data, the currency, as it, as it were. Yeah. And, and I think the, the third one that I heard is when investing in infrastructure for businesses moving forward, flexibility and scalability are the two key things 
that everybody needs to be looking out for to help evolve us in this ever-changing situation and as the infinite enterprise continues to evolve. Very critical. As we decentralize, we have to be more focused on the things that are the the currency and the security, right? They all build on top of one another. So yeah, absolutely. I think that the, the, the decentralization and the flexibility of that decentralization are going to be, uh, are going to be key drivers. Great. Well, I have learned a lot as a non-networking technologist. I'm, I've, I've gotten my points. I know what to look for. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. And as a technologist who, uh, who dips his toe in, in the business end of things, it's also good to be able to see what the big idea translates to when it comes to actual product execution. So I think uh, that this was a fantastic opportunity to learn. And, uh, and I think our guests were, were excellent guests to help guide us through this Absolutely. And uh, so thank you again, everyone, for for joining us. I hope you've learned a little bit something. We've talked a little bit about how we're going to get there. And uh, we're going to continue the conversation on the next podcast. I look forward to it. Thanks for your time, Carla. Bye. Join us on the next episode of Inflection Points, where we start to examine the impact of Gen Z on the infinite enterprise. Carla and I will speak with Michelle Taffler, Senior Vice President, Client Services at Gene Agency, a Toronto-based agency with a focus on health brands. We'll discuss how Gen Z may want to experience the infinite enterprise and how they're going to change the world.